Hey, welcome to our presentation today. We're going to be talking about FinOps and cloud cost, but part of what we're going to go through is going beyond just reporting and reacting to cost problems in the public cloud, but actually going backward and seeing if we can address the root cause of those problems. I'm Brad Parks. I manage product marketing, product management here for Morpheus Data. I'm joined by Phil Shaw, who runs our customer success organization. We're going to bring him on later in the uh, later in the presentation. He'll give us a, a perspective from his years, actually, as a customer in the enterprise IT trenches. So excited to to do that. But before we before we get to Phil, I'm going to cover a few few topics just to set a baseline. First, talk a little bit about how application provisioning is what leads to these cloud cost problems in the first place talk about the FinOps Foundation and some of the frameworks they provide, um, talk about how we can help you get ahead of that problem, bring in Phil, and then wrap it up with uh, a demo. So let's jump right in. So we know that cloud in large part, and particularly public cloud, was driven by application developers, database analysts, other end users who were tired of waiting on IT to actually provision those applications. So let's take a look at that classic data center central IT view that a lot of you are probably familiar with. In a traditional data center, right, when you buy infrastructure, typically that's a purchase that a company will make every three to five years, new compute, storage, and networking refreshes. That takes a while to get stood up, work its way through procurement, and at provision time, right, that end user will typically request a resource from IT. They might do a ticket in service now or have a spreadsheet they fill out. Then, unfortunately, this day or multi-week you know, death march happens where IT will look for resources, provision VMs, attach security agents, create backup jobs, all of the things that need to happen to then turn over that production-ready resource to the guy who requested it. Because it takes so long, what usually happens is that that end user says, you know, I may need a little bit more than I think I do. I'm going to go ahead and ask for a, a bigger resource, maybe more compute or more storage than I think I might need. Because as this thing grows, I don't want to have to go back in line and wait again. The result, you end up with a lot of wasted capacity on premises. And sometimes when these teams are done with those resources, they don't always give them back. They might repurpose it for something else or just forget about it and, and eventually IT loses visibility. So let's compare and contrast that to the public cloud. Right? Everyone knows that public cloud is growing hand over fist and a lot of that is because these same end users just wanna get things on demand. They wanna scale as they need. And from a finance perspective, organizations like the concept of paying as you go versus these big stair step infrastructure refreshes. Fortunately though, we see some of the same patterns in users will swipe a credit card and go to AWS, Azure, and still ask for more than they need. Why? Because they can, right? We all kind of think, <laughs> think we just wanna get the, the fastest car, the biggest engine, because hey, we might need that power at some point, might as well get it. Again, the result, slightly different view, but. Devs aren't going through IT oftentimes. They're provisioning on demand, but IT still handles the payment of those public cloud bills. So they're there scratching their head, wondering why they've got massive cost overruns. They get yelled at by finance. Nobody's happy. So application provisioning, whether it's in the on-prem data center or in the public cloud, is really where things start. IT exists to support business applications. Pretty simple. Let's take a look at how a lot of companies are addressing some of those cost problems, particularly in the public cloud today. Um, if you're not familiar with them, the FinOps Foundation is an organization that was created a number of years ago by a consortium of cloud cost management vendors. In this case, I think it was Cloudability, which ultimately got purchased by Aptio and recently got acquired by IBM. But other vendors, along with their customers, said, hey, we need to we need a place we can go just to talk about this new cloud cost discipline that we're trying to put into our organizations. It's a great organization, you should go check it out. They have lots of resources. This is not a commercial for them. We're actually a member of the FinOps Foundation, but 
just wanted to highlight it's a way to think about cloud cost. They have phases, right, that they think about. First, in their vernacular, is you got to get visibility of what you're doing. You've got to optimize how you're thinking about things. Once you realize you have cost problems, you should optimize those and fix the, you know, fix that, or reduce your cloud cost, maybe optimize it. And then you use all that information maybe to, to make better decisions about who you in, invest with as a public cloud provider. It's all well and good. And you can apply that logic to the scenario we had previously, right? You can certainly get reports on your data center use, should always do that. You can use those to delete and shut things down, maybe implement some, uh, some uh, automation to right size those after the fact. And you can put that data back to your development teams and say, hey, try not to do that again next time, project team. And while that's all well and good, I would describe that as firefighting, right? If there's a fire, you need to put it out. But I think taking the matches away, right, and actually fireproofing your house is probably a better way to prevent fires. So in addition to having tools to fight fires, what we want to talk about is moving upstream and actually stopping things before they become a problem. And that's where hybrid cloud platform operations and cloud management come in. So very quick, what does that mean? Well, in a hybrid cloud platform operations context, you have a central group and a central platform or set of tools that you wrap around private and public clouds. And embedded inside the platform is a role-based access engine and a set of policies that you can apply. Again, if we think about that provisioning process that I described earlier, the root cause of those cost problems is provisioning applications, right? We already went through that. Well, platform operations and platform engineering teams are being stood up with an eye towards developer self-service, creating what is often referred to as a paved road so that these teams can go into a single portal, you know, hit a button, run a Terraform script, hit an API or a command line and get their applications, their databases provisioned on demand, right? That's the, that's the dream of the cloud, on-demand provisioning. However, if you think about that with a FinOps view, shifting left or moving closer to the point of provisioning can let you do some interesting things that will eventually impact cost. You can present those costs at time of provisioning, you can actually put guardrails around who can provision what. And you can even do things like enforce budget policy. So that is one of the, the key areas that platform operations teams are focused on. On the other end, once you've centralized across your public and private clouds, you get this normalized or consistent view of how infrastructure is being used, who's using it, and what's contributing to cost. So you do get that information that starts that FinOps life cycle. But again, just want to highlight the goal should be to shift left and try and stop those problems before they start. Now, we are on a Morpheus presentation. I want to tell you a little bit about what Morpheus is and how we might help you address those problems. And then I'm going to flip over to Phil and we're going to, we're going to get real because um, Maybe preceding the entry, Phil spent a good part of his career actually managing this mess and, and dealing with end users, vendors, and cloud costs, um, and had so much fun doing it. He actually joined Morpheus a number of years ago. So what is Morpheus? We are a software platform, right, that was really born with that developer self-service in mind. But... We work with IT teams, security teams, and finance teams to make sure you put those guardrails around your platform and then turn the keys over so developers can do self-service across clouds, clusters, as well as how they're taking advantage of automation tools. What does that look like? Well, we give you a, a single portal, a single API command set, and a single a Terraform provider in this case, or CloudFormation, so that you can get VMs, container clusters, and applications provisioned on demand 
in a consistent way across any of your on-prem hypervisors, as well as your public clouds. So we're an abstraction layer that lets you go into any hypervisor or cloud without having to be an expert in those native portals. We've applied that same self-service context to Kubernetes clusters. We can apply that to how your teams use automation tools. So if you wanna be able to run your Terraform plays, your Ansible scripts, your Bash, your PowerShell, we can do automation on demand. Think about things like patch management or just running cleanup automation, the grunt work of IT. We can turn that into a catalog driven experience. And then lastly, we do tie into your classic ITSM and ITOM tools. So if you want to be able to push updates into your service now, um, tie into AI ops tools, take that monitoring data and do something with it, we bring that into the platform. I try and avoid the single pane of glass analogy, but we do sit at the heart of a lot of the tools that enterprises already have, and we give you the ability to, to pull those all into a framework. Now, what does that mean to the different stakeholders inside IT? Well, if, if self-service is what makes a cloud a cloud, again, first and foremost, we're gonna help you in IT bring all those tools together, get your private cloud truly functioning and, and unify how you think about public cloud. For security teams, if you're trying to get closer to dev and, and get DevSecOps processes into place, we'll give you a, a place to connect to your identity providers, set up policies, report on what packages are inside your environment, even rotate and manage your security credentials. We're not a security tool, but we help security come into the fold. We turn that platform over to the development team so they can get what they need on demand using the patterns and tools they already have. And then lastly, where FinOps comes back in is we are going to let you discover all of the inventory of VMs, containers, and other applications that are already in your environment. And we do start running analytics and we can help you fight that fire, right? We'll give you an easy button to push to reduce your memory, your CPU, your storage, to, to get a handle on cloud costs for what you already have. But more importantly, we're gonna put those guardrails around budgets so that people can only provision what they should. And we give you one place to do things like charge back and show back. So at a glance, that is what Morpheus is all about. But I think where it, rubber hits the road is how that works inside the enterprise. And that's, that's why I invited Phil to join me and appreciate him uh, getting up early UK time or actually staying up late UK time. I'm, uh, I'm all twisted around, but Phil, why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about, you know, what you do for Morpheus today. I'll be honest, Phil is a Morpheus employee, but I think why I invited him on is really what he spent years doing uh, inside AstraZeneca. Thanks, Brad. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm the uh, director of customer success at Morpheus. So really the role is to make sure that all our customers are happy and they're getting uh, what they need out of Morpheus. The reason why they bought Morpheus in the first place, you know, they will have had a business case, what they wanted to achieve with Morpheus. And we're here to make sure that they're successful and they deliver on that promise when they went ahead and purchased Morpheus. And in terms of uh, my former role, I'm going to have to cast my mind back three and a half years now, Brad, believe it or not. It's been a fun and, run. Uh, I know, yeah. Well, you know, AstraZeneca, just like pretty much most companies, are always focused on providing IT excellence while also reducing costs. So I was lucky enough to be part of the infrastructure team at AstraZeneca, and it was a fantastic role and a great company, obviously. Um, so what we do, we would highlight key initiatives or legacy platforms that required review. So it was a great opportunity to see things that could be improved uh, and go ahead and, and achieve that success. Uh, so we'd gather the requirements and then we'd look in the marketplace to see what was out there in terms of best of breed. And this could be hardware or it could be software. Um, and we always try to address the technical and the business side of the problem, which sounds really obvious. We would always have a three vendor bake off. We try to have a three vendor bake off and we'd usually have a favorite even entering into the bake off. And it was obviously based on functionality and obviously cost. Uh, sometimes we'd pay a bit more though, obviously for the right tool. So we were always careful uh, in that bake off. And then once we were settled on a tool or the, or the hardware of choice, then we had to do the, the most difficult bit was to do the financial justification and get it passed as a business case internally uh, at AstraZeneca. 
I, um, you know, it's funny being, you know, I was an end user a long, long, long time ago, longer than three and a half years ago, but I, I was, was to a system admin and a DBA and then did buy a fair amount of IT over the years. But as I moved into the vendor world uh, later in my career, I, it was funny as a vendor, we always do ROI calculators and, you know, surprise, surprise, the vendor ROI calculators never show you losing money. Like it, it's, it's crazy <laughs> how that works, right? We always yeah. somehow end up doing math equations that show us doing real well. So I, I was always uh, excited when, you know, when met you and I found out that you actually spent time, you know, doing that from the customer out versus IT vendor in. And so I think it was interesting to look at what are the, you know, what are the kind of things that you would, you would look at to, to kind of do that justification? Yeah. So it, it, the, the difficulty uh, with the role uh, was, it was always something different. It wasn't the same topic. So it could be say like a backup tool. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be able to report on all backups and we had various different flavors of backup technology, you know, right across the world. So we had 12,000 servers. I think we had about six backup products. <laughs> then we'd go to market, find one, and then we had to work out, you know, how it paid for itself. So there's, there's lots of different ways in terms of, you know, in terms of automation, for example, if you bring in automation in, that means there's less need for say tickets. You know, we at the time uh, outsourced our service desk, for example. So if we said, well, we don't need to raise tickets anymore because it's now a self-service option and we can automate that, that then meant there was a cost saving there, for example. Um, uh, if it was a ticket that would go into, you know, an ITSM tool such as ServiceNow or Remedy, then someone would have to manually pick that tool up or somebody would have to direct that case to somebody else and they'd have to work on it again, hands on keyboards again, there's a cost associated with all that. So we would sort of pick apart the process and see, you know, where we could make savings. And yes, generally we would make it pay, of course, but there was there was a lot of work that, that had to go into those. And, and when I first started at Morpheus, you know, I saw that in the sales process um, that, you know, customers would really like Morpheus and then they had to do the really difficult bit and, and get, get it to pay for itself or make a saving. And then I, uh, I was happy to work with those customers and still am today to try and help them along as to, you know, where we feel that we can make a saving. Yeah, it's been interesting to see this, this market evolve, right? Things like, like backup or storage or compute, pretty well established domains that companies have been buying for 20 years. So not a lot, I mean, exciting technology, don't get me wrong, but a, a pretty established spending pattern. I think centralizing provisioning and doing automation across private and public clouds is a new a newish area for a lot of a lot of companies so maybe talk a little bit about tactically you know as as you went into that and where we met each other what you know what was that project about and and what was the impact of that yeah so so, so devops and finops was was about around that time was a fairly new concept um so like I said, all the initiatives that we that we wanted to do had to pay for themselves or ideally make a saving. One of the largest ones that we did while we were there was uh, the insourcing of uh, management and support of IT. Um, so we had outsourced to various different suppliers. Um, we had this ecosystem, um, which really slowed things down. Um, and the model was then to move to what we call global technology centers. So we had one in Chennai, one in Guadalajara. And the idea was that we were going to do the same role with less people uh, than, than our previous suppliers. And that obviously required automation and self-service. So as part of that initiative, we took the decision uh, also to move away from the vRealize suite uh, that we were using at the time. And the, uh, we obviously moved to, to Morpheus as, as the alternative solution. It was, it was a cheaper alternative. It was easier to implement. Uh, there was lots of lots of benefits to Morpheus, um, which I can can discuss as well. Uh, but both initiatives in terms of the, bringing the GTCs in, so it was a, a cost saving because we could automate things within uh, tools like Morpheus. We saved fifty million dollars over five years, and we actually won uh, a CTO award uh, for the project. And Morpheus was a, a big part of that project being successful. That's Fantastic. So I think one of the um, one of the last pieces, I, I guess, that I want to make sure we, we highlight, because we've talked a lot about just the raw cost of, of infrastructure, right? And again, uh, think about cloud cost management. A lot of that traditionally has been 
what is my bill from AWS or on-premises? How much compute and storage am I using? I think part of kind of widening that aperture that I, that I you know I'd like to make sure people leave with is is all of the other costs. And you mentioned you know some of that are the the FTEs. So as you insourced, you you could get to the same outcome with less people. Any any other things we haven't yet talked about that you might tie in that, that added to that? To yeah. That next so statement? again, the, the public cloud wasn't brand new, but it was fairly new to us. So. You know, you've got your corporate IT with within AstraZeneca. It's a, it's a big machine, and it's big for a reason. Um, you know, we had people, you know, customers going off and, and doing their own thing on on credit cards. They go to AWS, and they, you know, they get sick of waiting for corporate IT to provide them access to the cloud. They go off and with their own credit card um, and, and have an a, a AWS or Azure account, which has massive implications, especially. The type of work that AstraZeneca do in terms healthcare of healthcare data. Know, that's yeah, that's not good. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. You know, drug data that was there and um, and patents, etc. So, from from a security and cost point of view, we were able to provide them access to then the public cloud with with all the guardrails in there as well. Um, and and obviously all those independent accounts that people have got all over the place. You know, there's sixty five thousand employees at AstraZeneca. You think about the cost there of many accounts rather than have it all under one umbrella we were able to you know bring that under one account uh, we were able to provide uh, self-service to, to, to any cloud um, so whether that be vmware gcp AWS, azure we were able to offer that so people didn't go off and do their own thing there was also a, a greater understanding for the actual costs as a whole so you know a, a director or a vp had asked you know how much are we spending on cloud because we had people doing their own thing in various different departments in such a large organization like AstraZeneca, we were able to pull all that information into Morpheus. So it's really easy, obviously, to you know point Morpheus at a cloud, whether that be on-prem or public cloud, and then that can go and discover what's out there and bring back all those costs so we can get those answers that you know senior management want to see in terms of what is the cloud spend. We also then had the opportunity to uh, to do right sizing, so we we're able to claw back and and the big ones save money, not just something to pay for itself. We were actually saving money and getting the most out of the hardware that we purchased in our data centers. Um, application teams, I think you referred to it at the start of your your slides there, sure. at the start of the presentation. You know they were very much working, um, and we were, when we were part of the right size exercise, we were trying to right size you know dev and test machines, and a lot of those machines weren't needed, weren't required, but they were so reluctant to let go of those machines because it was so hard to get them in the first place. It took so long to get them through the the manual process and all the various teams that we had to go through to get those machines built. Whereas when we provide database and application as a service via a self service portal, you know that 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 want and desire to hold on to machines that weren't required uh, had gone away. Um, and then, but also you mentioned policies as well. We were confident to offer self-service because we could apply the right policies to the various different teams and departments and groups that we're going to be accessing Morpheus so that we, we, we could be free and happy and confident to offer self-service. And we were also able to offer um, end-to-end automation including uh, validation from a compliance point of view for things like GXP and SOX point of view as part of every build uh, of machines and servers in AstraZeneca, they all have to be validated. And we were able to automate that validation uh, approach, which again would take extra time. And then the sort of icing on the cake was we had an application called Empower. So Empower was used um, for testing drug batches so before the drugs that we produced could go out to market, we would have to take sample tests to make sure, you know, they were where they should be, uh, had all the right ingredients in there. And, uh, you know, if, if Empower was down, it was, we, you know, we lost the company millions because we weren't able to ship product, obviously. So we were able to capture Empower in a Morpheus blueprint, which meant we could provision that application absolutely anywhere uh, in any cloud. So that was a, a real bonus to uh, to Morpheus, something that really we sort of hadn't purchased the tool for in the first place. To be totally honest, nice. um, well, sorry, man. That's nice. No, yeah. If you can find some hidden value along the way, that that's uh, cherry on top. Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. Right. But as part of the exercise, obviously, um, you know, I did the previous exercise to, to work on Morpheus to say how we bring it in and the justification, the financial justification. Uh, um, but it was nice to be on the other side and, and be a, a part of the Morpheus, Morpheus team to then do the ROI exercise to actually prove, you know, mm. what we saved. Um, and uh, I believe it's a case study that's available on the website Correct. as well. So the yes. total saving, I believe, was six million across Thank three you. years based on all the possible ways that, you know, Morpheus can save money. There's, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, not all of them are applicable to, to every company, uh, sure. but we think we've got most covered. And, you know, it's brought significant value through discovery and automation for, uh, for AstraZeneca. Brilliant. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out and I'll do a, I guess I'll do a, a little commercial or, or volunteer Phil for future work. Um, now that he's on the spot, if, you know, as you come in the, to Morpheus, you're thinking about a proof of concept, you're working with one of our teams. Um, I will, uh, I'll volunteer Phil's uh, skill set as you're trying to navigate your own, you know, internal machinations, we often uh, do pair him up with, you know, with new customers or people thinking about Morpheus because he does bring that reality check uh, to the table. And uh, even though he's he's now joined us on the dark side as a vendor, he definitely wears his customer hat and is as much of an advocate for customers internally as he, as he is for Morpheus. So I'm going to kind of wrap this up with a very quick demo. I mean, I could spend hours turning over every rock and nook and cranny in Morpheus, but but really I want to just do a quick highlight reel of, of some of what uh, Phil and I touched on as it relates to the platform itself. So this is the main Morpheus dashboard. Um, very quickly, we, we are a software platform. We can install and run inside your data center walls and punch back out to the public cloud. We can also live up in the public cloud and reach down into your on-prem data center. We don't care. Wherever you need it to run, However you need it managed, we can help you out. This is the main dashboard view though. And as you can see it, you know, it's very graphical, shows you at a glance, where are my workloads? Are they up? Are they down? A lot of operational data. But since we're here talking about, about cost and about that end user experience, I'm actually gonna kind of jump in and, and provision a thing, right? Back to that very first slide I showed, if, if I'm trying to request a resource from IT, in the Morpheus context, I'm going to go into a centralized catalog, and if you do have developers, you know, don't be scared. We actually are a you know an API first engine. Our API CLI has over a thousand different options and commands in it. Anything you see that I do, most of our end user developers are actually doing this all via API as part of their pipelines, or they're using Terraform. So we that is actually our our native tongue, but. I'm a click ops guy and, and from a presentation perspective, GUIs are nice. So we're gonna do this in the GUI, but have no fear. Uh, it, all of this is done programmatically on the back end and the front end if you, uh, if you so choose. So I'm just gonna spin up a, a quick Apache server as an example, typical web service. I'm gonna select a member of a group, which is gonna inform what clouds I have access into. It's where that role-based access model starts to come in. I'm gonna actually choose AWS. We'll do this in the public cloud. I've got a naming policy here, but from a budget perspective, and that, that's really what I wanted to highlight. Let's say I, you know, I need a, an Apache, I'm gonna run it on Ubuntu, but back to that original scenario, I'm pretty proud of my application and, and I think it's gonna need some horsepower. In fact, it's gonna need a lot of horsepower. We're gonna do an, an extra large, you know, M5 up in the public cloud. Actually, even that, forget it. I'm going to go straight to, let's go 32 cores, 60. This this thing is going to need some horsepower. Not cheap at $1,000 a month, but it's what I want. I'm going to hit next. And, I, oh, well, it looks like somebody in IT, maybe someone who looks like Phil, uh, probably said, you know, guy, this is really a test and dev box. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't think you need what you think you need. If you do need that, give me a ring and we'll, we'll talk, but why don't you start with something a little smaller? In fact, this is gonna exceed a policy that was put in place by a hefty amount. And, all right, you got me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and let's, let's start with something a little more sensical. 
then uh, then we'll we'll go from there. So you can see here that this is actually showing me real time what the price is going to be, and it's synchronizing all that real time from the public clouds. But one of the other pieces to to help me make smart choices as an end user, this is going to show me what are some of the other options I have, either in my on-prem data center or other public clouds that I have access to. Now, our demo lab has way more clouds than a typical environment might, but typical customer might have, hey, my, my on-prem vCenter or my AWS account and maybe an Amazon account. But whatever I have access to as a user is what's going to show here. So I'm going to stick with AWS. I feel confident in that choice. It's great. Pick security group and hit next. All right, mischief managed. It's going to let me do that in, when it's small. But one of the other pieces I want to highlight that's built in, in addition to be able to automate, you know, deploying code, running scripts, creating load balancers, from a cost perspective, one of the other pieces that we bake in is, is life cycle management. So uh, Phil even mentioned these, these machines that would end up littering cloud accounts or the on-prem data center because people just either don't clean up after themselves or they, they cling to that resource. Well, here, our lab manager knows I'm awful and he's put in a policy that says, hey, Brad, when you're doing these presentations or doing demos for customers, we're actually going to automatically shut that machine down in one day and we're going to delete it in two days unless you hit a button and ask for an extension. So it's going to self-maintain that environment. Also, we have the ability to do things like power schedules. In this case, it hasn't been a, a forced policy. It could be, but I could say, hey, look, I'm, I'm a little lazy. I'm going to get up at 8 a.m. and I'm going to clock out at 5 p.m. In those off hours, I don't want Amazon to charge me for this resource because I'm just doing some testing. I'm going to automatically shut that machine off and, and save a bit of money. Again, these are the types of things you can bake in out of the gate so that costs don't become a problem afterwards. So that's a quick view of just a couple of the provisioning elements related to cost. But the other piece of the equation is that is that firefighting. Fires do happen. You need to fight them, particularly if, if Morpheus is coming into a brownfield where you may already have a thousand instances in the public cloud and you might be spending 30 or 40 percent more than you probably should. So one of the first things we do as a platform when we connect to your public cloud account or connect to your vCenter or your Nutanix environment, what have you, is we will inventory everything that's already there and we'll start to pull that data in. So even if we didn't help you provision it, we're going to get that information and we will start running some base level analytics using machine learning against that data and we'll start to give you some recommendations. We pull all of that data into this normalized view so that you're not having to wade through, well, how does my how does my fill keep track of my on-prem you know, cost? How does AWS report my public cloud cost there? What kind of file do I get from GCP? I've talked to a lot of customers who, you know, big customers who literally are doing this with pivot tables and Power BI and a lot of manual work. Well, Morpheus has a database view that we pull it all in so you can slice and dice what group, what tag, what project, what cloud, we give you all of that data in one place. But more importantly, we're actually going to give you guidance. Oh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. I'm going to give you guidance on how you can take all of that data and maybe save a bit of money. So we're going to give you a recommendation. In this case, don't tell our lab manager. We've got $2,400 a month in potential savings sitting out there. Here you'll see even a, a discovered instance that we didn't provision. We can say, hey, it looks like in, uh, let's, let's look at AWS just, uh, just for grins, see if I can find one. These are all on-prem, but here's an AWS instance. Looks like it's telling me I should do a reserved instance. In this case, I could save $34 a month or in the case of one of these on-prem examples, I may only be using, yeah, I'm using 5% of the compute power that I've asked for. I'm using seven, you know, 7% of the memory, I over provisioned. I'm actually gonna get a button to push. If I hit this, it's gonna take that machine image, actually resize it, and then present it back to the user with all the same credentials and IP address. So it'll help me tune up my environment.
So right sizing, optimization, reporting, those classic FinOps features built into Morpheus, along with those guardrails to stop the problem where it starts at provision time. So that was the the lightning round uh, demo. Again, I would love to spend some time with uh, with you and your teams um, actually looking at that information over, over time. Um, and so what I guess I'd offer as we wrap up the presentation is we'd love to get you in to do a proper demo. I'd like to say mine's okay, but one of our solutions engineers can spend an hour really learning about your environment, show you every nook and cranny and give you a feel for what, what Morpheus is all about. We do proof of concept deployments for customers all the time. Actually, another AstraZeneca data point it was fun. Um, when we did that POC, I think uh, one, of, one of Phil's colleagues who we worked with uh, was pleasantly surprised that we had their POC up and running by the end of a few hours, literally. He was able to turn that over to an end user who could go into a portal, click a button and get a, a VM provision. And then I think their case VMware in less than a day. And that was after uh, I won't throw stones working with a, another vendor for a, a number of months to get that same experience. And I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating with that. Yeah, no, night and day, night and day. Yeah. And then lastly, we do have uh, some promotions going on right now. Uh, sales would kill me if I, I didn't say something. We know that 2023 is a difficult economic environment. It's hard to free up cash, you know, even if you can prove IT value. So one of the things we are doing for a lot of customers who, who have problems, they're trying to implement financial controls, but they just can't access the budget that they need to do the projects. We know it takes a while to get your teams up and running, trained, tools deployed, new processes in place. Even though Morpheus can get up and running very fast, we know there's a lot of other things that go into an actual deployment inside IT. I mean, IT is hard. What we've done now is, is actually flipping the script. We want to get you up and running and installed. We want to get you some of your team into some training, get you comfortable with the platform, get you connected with Phil's customer success team, get you a minimum amount of, of software licenses, but really think about solution first and then kick the can down the road. And, and as you get into 2024, you can plan for your budget and, and you can grow that software license as appropriate without that holding you back and or even giving you a free bursting so that you can start to right sizing your accounts here in 2023. So it's, you know, I think it's around 50, 60 K. I mean, I, I, don't quote me on it, but it's a very cost effective package depending on your scenario. Obviously there's some caveats, but um you know, if you're if you're thinking about this space, just know that we are we are here for you, and we are trying to make sure that you can get going without having to worry too much about some massive budget that you may not have yet this year. So, again, I'd invite you to uh, come in, request a demo. Um, again, we can buy you lunch. We'll help. Uh, we'll help make it easy for you. We'd love to talk to you. Um, and with that, I would just say thanks for. Thanks for listening to Phil and I for a bit and uh, look forward to talking to you soon.